You know this presidential race is out of control when the Republican standard bearer from the last election trying to take down and take down very vocally the front runner this time around. Of course, I'm talking about Romney v. Trump. But is there any historical precedent for something like we're seeing right now? Well, that's what I asked Julian Zelizer, professor of history and public affairs at Princeton University. You know, I want to talk history with you, Julian, but let's put it in context to what I saw today. I can't remember, uh, forget about an establishment candidate within a party, but the former nominee from just four years ago eviscerating or attempting to at least the leader of that same party um, running for that nomination. Uh, using history as a guide, is there anything comparable where there is an intent, a mission of, you know, aim and destroy uh, one of their own this far, this fast? Not this far. I mean, the, the only recent example I can think of was when Bill Clinton went after Barack Obama during some of the primaries when Obama was facing off against Hillary in 2008. But it was nothing like this. Uh, this was a point-by-point -point effort to decimate uh, the current frontrunner of his own party. And then a response came a little bit later where Trump did the same. Yeah, I, I, I tried to follow that press conference that was interesting or a modern art form if you want to call it that but if we're looking to history as a guide and I read your piece recently where you asked the question if we're seeing 64 all over again with Trump if he is a modern day Barry Goldwater you talked about some of the similarities and also some of the very stark differences what do you think have we seen this act before or is this kind of uh, something completely different um, than we've really seen in the past talking obviously about Donald Trump well, certainly in 1964, you had an example with Goldwater where the nominee was off uh, center or very different than where a lot of the party was. Uh, so in that respect, this is similar. Uh, there's not a lot of cases where the main candidate is so different in some ways uh, than where a lot of the party leaders are. So he's a very unique figure, Donald Trump, and uh, he doesn't fit into any orthodoxy at this point. Uh, so I think it is in many ways a rare moment when it actually is as unique as it seems. In writing about it, and I know that um, you've authored a book on, on the Johnson years, in talking to some of the folks close to the campaign, that famous uh, daisy ad uh, where you saw the kid picking the daisies and the countdown uh, to the nuclear mushroom cloud that went off, they effectively spoke to the fears that Goldwater engendered, that he scared people. Now. Trump scares people for different reasons. He scares the establishment uh, about what he could mean and maybe longer term to the party. Uh, he scares some other people with what he says about the walls and banning Muslims and, and some of those other policies, let alone carpet bombing whole portions of the Middle East. But he doesn't seem to scare people the same way that Goldwater did. Um, is that just as of now, between now and November, that will happen? We saw some of the national security folks, 50 of them, uh, all sign off on the same letter that he's not prepared to be commander in chief. It doesn't feel the same, though, in terms of that fear factor of Goldwater. Well, part of what's happened is the electorate's very different. So, you know, right now, as we've discussed so many times uh, in the media, that the electorate is really polarized, and there's not a lot of places where voters are willing to switch from one party to another. That wasn't the case back in the 1960s. There was more movement in a lot of states. Uh, and I think that insulates Donald Trump uh, to a certain extent. There's no way... Uh, voters in many red states are going to vote for a Democrat, which is what happened in 1964. Uh, and I also think, you know, Donald Trump is different than a lot of the party. He's scaring a lot of the party leaders. But he's also playing to a lot of the elements of the Republican electorate that have come uh, front and center in recent years with the Tea Party. So um, I think it's uh, too quick to say that if he is the nominee, there'll be this huge backlash against the Republicans that will benefit Democrats. You know, I hear the argument, and, and obviously, factually, you're right that we are more polarized as a country, but explain to me, Julian, how evangelicals will wait hours online to hear Donald Trump fly in on a chopper or a jet with his name affixed to the side, on record as being pro-life very recently, supporting, um, you know, uh, gay marriage, certainly in the past. Every social policy you can think of certainly does not have a long history of agreeing with them, yet they align themselves with them. If they're so polarized, why do they give him a pass on issues that seem to matter most to them when they wouldn't anyone else? 
Well, it's because they want to win. And I think there is a sense with many evangelicals that, you know, their candidates have not done well. Uh, many of them believe the stakes of this election, as became evident with uh, Scalia's passing, are great. And it is polarization that moves a lot of them. It's, it's calculation. Uh, part is an attraction to Donald Trump, the personality. We can't discount that. Uh, but part, I think, evangelicals are thinking through politically who will give them the White House. And in the end, saying even with all his uh, positions that, and lifestyle that doesn't match what we believe in, he still will be a Republican. He'll be working with the Republican Congress. And he's a much better bet than Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders to deliver the kind of issues we want. So they're betting on a winner, a Republican winner in their mind. Julian, you've heard a lot of, um, I guess, the first guessing, which is we're seeing the modern day in real time rupturing of the Republican Party. Um, certainly you're seeing the fight as we saw play out just today between the establishment and then certainly Trump. But when you look at the demographics, you look at the trending of this country getting less white. Um, are we seeing, if not what happened to the Whig Party many a year ago, but are we seeing the end of the Republican Party as we know it? We're going to see some facsimile thereof going forward, and it maybe it won't change state to state, but on a national level, we're going to see a different kind of Republican Party going forward. Well, at some point, we'll have to if the Republicans want to survive, because the demographics, uh, the changes in society and culture, none of any of these changes make the modern Republican Party look very rational politically. So there will be changes over time. It's too early to tell if, if this is the moment we're going to see something happen. Uh, it's not clear that Donald Trump is the face of the Republican Party for decades to come, as opposed to four to eight years. And it's not clear that the splits that we've seen so far uh, are going to really create this civil war within the Republican Party. It could ultimately be contained if Trump keeps, you know, rolling up his delegate numbers and everyone falls in line. But, but the Republican Party will have to change. And I think many Republicans are aware of that. And, and that's part of what scares them, that Trump actually, some of the things he says, moves the party in the wrong, exact wrong direction of what they need to be doing. Julian Zelizer, thank you so much. I appreciate thank a few you. minutes. Thank you. We come back. We're going to have to look at some local headlines. Please sue us.